Sarai, how do you like my screen? Nice. These are your parents, Raju. No, this is mentor. Huh? That's his mentor. My mentor. Oh, okay. Sorry. And today is a very special day. Oh, okay. It's special for me, but why is it special for you, Raju? His 80th birthday. Oh, what's his name? Hi, uh, he goes by Chandu. Uh huh. Uh, his name is Karna Dev Bardham. Mm, okay. Kelly Bardham. So it's also very interesting that you are doing the Duvarnam section. Uh oh, okay. And that's uh, where he started his uh, career. Oh, okay. On uh, the Warner Lulses. Hey, okay, good. That's so good. Yeah, so a little bit of uh, background about him. Uh, he is, uh, <clears throat> he went to CNC Velour mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. Velour is in Tamil Nadu. Mm -hmm. And uh, after finishing his uh, med school, uh, he went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Wow. Okay. And uh, did his uh, DPhil uh, from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gauri. And Gauri is uh, his wife and mm -hmm. uh, the pillar, I should put it that way. Okay. So Gauri is a hematologist. So they both started their career in Rotherham. And uh, he started his work on the Wardnell ulcer. Uh, he did uh, probably the first trial on the role of uh, H2 blockers in peptic ulcer. Wow, that's so great. So, so great. and uh, so the amazing thing is, you may not know this, or you may know this, uh, in England, you have university hospitals and district general hospitals, right? Okay. The district general hospitals are like community hospitals. Okay. And uh, Rotherham is uh, in Yorkshire, and it's a district general hospital where they had four physicians, each one ru running their own service. So one physician was an internal medicine plus cardiology, and one was a internal medicine rheumatology, and Dr. Bardan ran internal medicine and the GI service. And uh, his unit consisted of basically uh, four people, basically. You know, himself as a consultant, a registrar, I worked for him as a registrar in 1990, and two uh, housemen. You know, these housemen are called you know, basically after med school, they do six months of internal medicine, six months of surgery, and uh, that's how it works. So the team consists of two housemen, a registrar, and Dr. Barda. Amazing thing is, you know, he did a lot of uh, clinical trials, uh, and as part of the clinical trials, right, you know, uh, Smith, Klein, and Beecham was responsible for simetidine development. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the money that he generated from the clinical trials went into a research and educational trust. He didn't take any money home. So that's called BRET, Baradam Research Educational Trust. And that actually supports uh, people doing their PhDs and people doing research. So for all the great work he did, uh, the British Empire, and knighted him as the Order of British Empire, OBE. And Rodera made the, I think is, uh, he was given the key of the uh, Rodera. That is, you know, he was, uh, he was um, made the man of the year for the town. Wow. So this morning, uh, you know, his daughter, Suchi. Uh, Suchi is a pediatric gastroenterologist at Hopkins and his son, Sonny, who is an MBA, 
uh, working for a nonprofit organization. And they organized uh, a bunch of us to join him at eight o'clock to wish him a happy birthday. So, really that's had a so time. great. Oh, oh, that's so great. All right. Uh, okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Selvi Theramurthy. I'm one of the gastroenterologists at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I work with uh, Dr. Raju, um, and uh, I am speaking about small bowel anatomy and physiology, and this is uh, Zoom class 12. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Raju, my good friend, who created this educational series and invited me to speak today. I appreciate the opportunity. I also want to uh, thank Dr. John Strohlein, who's the chair of our department, and he enthusiastically supports all of our educational efforts. So thank you, John. I definitely want to recognize Angela Deal, who's our medical illustrator, all of the drawings and images that you see um, in my presentation today were done by her and I worked closely with her um, to kind of get the right uh, images to convey the right message. Um, she's really extraordinary, so uh, my deep thanks to her. And I also want to recognize um, Dr. Dong Wang Wei, who is our uh, GI pathology fellow at MD Anderson and all of the histology uh, slides that I'll show in my presentation were um, provided by him. So um, I, of course, all of these um, presentations are uploaded to Dr. Raju's YouTube channel. So if there's anything that you want to review or see again, or if you want to refer any of your colleagues or coworkers to watch this uh, presentation, um, it should be up there. So uh, even though, we're talking about the small bowel. It's actually a huge topic. Um, and so some of the things that I wanted to touch on are um, the anatomic features of the small bowel, um, especially looking at it from an endoscopic view, since this is an endoscopy um, educational series. Um, I also want to go over what uh, the small bowel does in terms of digestion and absorption. And then I thought it would be nice to kind of discuss some interesting cases that I've had uh, with small bowel disease, just to put it into a clinical context. Um, as I said, this is a huge topic. I can only touch on uh, some of these areas, um, and I hope that I stimulate interest for people to go and read more about these um, uh, topics on their own. So we'll get started with anatomy uh, of the small bowel. We'll look at the endoscopy and uh, the histology. So uh, Zoom class three was uh, the esophagus. Uh, Zoom class five, uh, which Raju did, Zoom class five was gastric anatomy and physiology, which I covered. And now, um, if you can see my mouse, hopefully, uh, we're talking about everything between the stomach and the colon. And so all of this is uh, small intestine or small bowel. And I'll probably use those terms um, interchangeably. They mean the same thing to me anyway. Um, okay, so uh, the small bowel or small intestine has three anatomic segments. It is not um, distinguishable generally with few exceptions when you're doing um, an endoscopy within the small bowel or an enteroscopy. Um, but the three segments that we'll be talking about um, have different functions uh, and they are the duodenum or duodenum. And again, I'll probably say it both ways, uh, the jejunum and the ileum. The length of the small bowel um, overall is anywhere between six to seven meters long or 22 feet. So you can appreciate that it's not always possible um, to examine the entire small bowel uh, using a, a scope, either from uh, the oral aspect or from the anal aspect. So let's get into it and we'll talk about the duodenum. So uh, the duodenum has a very close relationship with uh, the pancreas, and it actually, the second portion wraps around the head of the pancreas, and that's important because the duodenum has one of the distinguishing anatomic features of the small bowel, which is the uh, ampulla or papilla, and again, those terms are um, interchangeable as well. The ampulla or papilla is the area where the pancreatic duct empties its juices that it gathers from the pancreatic parenchyma and the bile duct empties the bile and other digestive juices that it gets from the liver. 
into uh, the lumen of the duodenum. So these digestive juices have to be in contact with the food that they're trying to digest. And uh, that's the reason why uh, the duodenum is an important um, location. So the duodenum itself is about a foot long um, and uh, has four segments itself. So the first portion of the duodenum is the duodenal bulb. The second portion is the descending duodenum. And here you can see that An uh, Angela's put the ampulla there. So that's where the ampulla is located. Uh, the third portion is the transverse duodenum or D3. And the fourth portion is the ascending duodenum or D4. Um, after D4, you basically are at the duodenal jejunal flexure or junction, and then the jejunum um, begins. So, um, of these four segments, it's important um, to know kind of where they are within uh, the peritoneal cavity. So the first portion of the duodenum is within the peritoneal cavity itself. It is attached to the liver by the hepatical duodenal ligament, which I've uh, shown here. Um, the second portion of the duodenum is retroperitoneal. It's behind the peritoneal cavity. Um, and that has implications for our colleagues that do um, ERCP and access the pancreatic duct or the biliary tree uh, from the second portion. So if there's perforations or contrast leak or bleeding, some of those things will occur within the retroperitoneal cavity and not within the peritoneum itself. The third and fourth portions of the duodenum are within the peritoneal cavity. And at the um, duodenojejunal um, junction or flexure is the ligament of trite. So this is um, uh, a ligament that basically attaches this flexure to the retroperitoneum. So how do you get there? Well, you have to start in the stomach and you have to get to the um, antrum. This is for the fellows that are um, watching this presentation. This is the antrum with uh, the pylorus in the middle. And uh, once you get to the pylorus, you basically want to uh, put the pylorus in the middle of your screen and apply um, gentle forward pressure. Sometimes just tapping on the suction will help you traverse um, the pyloric channel. So once you're in the um, duodenum, this is the duodenal bulb. Um, and it's important to be able to localize things within the duodenal bulb. So everybody just kind of take a minute and um, uh, tell yourself where the anterior wall of the duodenal bulb is and where the posterior wall of the bulb is. So um, there was a, a, a study that was published back in 1992 um, in endoscopy. There was a group at the University of South Florida who noticed that there was a discrepancy between where the endoscopists were describing duodenal bulb lesions like ulcers or bleeds um, and where they actually ended up being when the patient went for a laparotomy. Again, this was 1992, so um, more of those uh, surgical interventions were done as opposed to other interventions. So they did a prospective study of 20 patients where, that were undergoing upper endoscopy procedures, and they had the fellow and the attending physician um, note uh, blindly where uh, the uh, anterior po or posterior aspect of the bulb was. Um, and uh, then they put the, this was in the left lateral um, decubitus position. Then they put the patient in the supine position and instilled some um, water with dye in it. And again, had them note which is the posterior aspect of the bulb. And maybe the fellows um, that are watching this presentation will get a kick out of the fact that both the attendings and the fellows were correct in locating the posterior aspect of the bulb less than 30% of the time. So most of the time they were incorrect. So um, once you've kind of, now you've uh, identified which, where you think the anterior um, wall of the bulb is, I will show you. So this is the anterior wall of the bulb. The contralateral wall is of course the posterior wall. The superior wall is the lesser curve and then the inferior being the greater curve. So the anterior wall, it, this is again in the patient, with the patient in the left lateral decubitus position. So you see that fluid pooling um, and that's generally gonna be at the anterior wall of the bulb. And generally, sometimes when you're advancing the scope, if you see any scope trauma, that will be against the anterior wall as well. Um, it is important to um, examine the posterior wall of the bulb, again, for the fellows that are watching, because <clears throat> you can definitely see pathology there. And so don't treat the duodenal bulb just as a conduit to get to the second portion of the duodenum. This is an important area to uh, examine and describe. 
So here we are, <clears throat> we've made it to the second portion of the duodenum. You can see all of these um, circular folds. The folds are called valvula conventes or plicae circularis. There are mucosal and submucosal circular folds that basically extend through the length of the small intestine. You saw that the duodenal bulb is generally spared um, and the ileum may have fewer folds, but these folds are generally present throughout the small bowel. Um, so the purpose of these folds are to increase the surface area for absorption of fluids and uh, nutrients. So uh, one of the um, distinguishing anatomic features of uh, the small bowel is the ampulla or major papilla. And there it is um, noted in my uh, picture here with the arrow. It's located in the second portion of the duodenum. So we'll take a closer look and you can see this is a little bit of a better look, but it's not a great look. And that's because I didn't um, use a cap on my scope when I did this procedure and that'll be relevant. We'll talk about that um, in a few minutes, but I would encourage all the fellows to routinely start examining um, the ampulla on all of their upper endoscopy procedures. This will help establish some good technique and uh, start building a mental atlas of pathology uh, of the ampulla. You can definitely see pathology there on a routine upper endoscopy procedure, and you'll be able to recognize what's normal, what's a variant of normal, and what's abnormal. So, um, the major papilla, as I said, was loca is located within the second portion of the duodenum. This is where the pancreatic duct empties into um, the duodenum and where the biliary tree or common bile duct measure, uh, empties into the duodenum as well. As you can see, the, um, the ampulla is made up of a muscular layer. Um, it's a circular muscle and it actually forms uh, a sphincter which controls the release of uh, digestive juices from the pancreas and from the liver in a controlled fashion. So that's the major papilla, and this is where um, ERCPs occur. So you'll note that with an ERCP procedure, you need to use a duodenoscope or a side viewer scope. You're going to get a much better look um, at the ampulla and have a more stable position in order to be able to do uh, what you need to do. Um, there's also, as you'll note here, a minor papilla, and this is located more proximal uh, in the duodenum or closer to the duodenal bulb. And it's, um, some, it's a little bit harder to identify because it can have a subtle appearance. Um, so the minor papilla uh, drains the accessory duct of Santorini. And in patients who have pancreas divisum, embryologically, when the embryo is forming, the two ducts, the um, duct of Worsung and the duct of Santorini don't fuse. And so you have um, a situation where the majority, the bulk of the pancreas is drained by um, uh, the, this accessory duct into a very small papilla. And these patients can have um, issues with recurrent pancreatitis. So here's an image uh, of the ampulla with uh, a side viewer. And you can see how the image is a lot better and you're able to see and uh, do a lot more in this position. So the uh, biliary uh, orifice or bile duct or orifice is going to be at the top, uh, the superior aspect of the ampulla and the pancreatic uh, duct orifice is going to be on the inferior aspect. So this is a, a beautiful picture that Angela uh, drew for me. Uh, this is uh, where the ampulla looks like um, in cross section once you've taken the mucosa off you can see that there's a circular muscle and that's the muscle that forms the sphincter of Odi and then the bile duct and the pancreatic duct. So this is uh, a, an image of an ERCP being performed. Um, you can see that the ampulla has actually been splayed open. A biliary sphincterotomy has been performed, which means the sphincter of Odi muscle has been cut, um, at least partially in this case. Um, the black wire is a guide wire that's within the bile duct or biliary tree. And then the green um, tube is a pancreatic duct stent. So you can see that the two openings are actually quite distinct and even more so once a biliary sphincterotomy has been performed. This is um, an image uh, that shows why uh, our therapeutic colleagues at MD Anderson end up doing a fair number of um, ERCP procedures. If you have a patient who has um, a tumor or a cancer in the head of the pancreas, it can cause uh, obstruction of the pancreatic duct, but more uh, consequentially, it can cause obstruction of the biliary tree, and patients will present with jaundice, maybe pruritus, um, dark urine, 
light colored stools and an elevated total bilirubin um, and imaging uh, studies may show biliary dilation. So by performing an ERCP, uh, our therapeutic colleagues are able to relieve the obstruction uh, within the bile duct uh, and uh, help the patient. So, as, uh, so the fellows are now all going to be examining uh, the ampulla when they do their upper endoscopy procedures. Um, and so here are some of the findings that you may see when you start examining uh, the ampulla routinely. This is a patient who's had a sphincterotomy done. So the opening here is a straight shot into the bile duct. It makes it a lot easier. And then the pancreatic duct opening is going to be down here in the tissue below. Some of the things that our um, therapeutic colleagues do in order to relieve the biliary obstruction that I talked about is to place an endobiliary stent. So this is a plastic stent in the bile duct. This, uh, the blue tube here is a um, endobiliary stent, so a stent in the bile duct. And the green tube is a uh, single pigtail pancreatic duct stent that was placed. And they can also play self-expanding metal stents, which have a, a wider diameter and a longer duration um, of uh, patency, again, for biliary obstruction. So um, I talked about a little bit about um, using a cap. And so I'm going to try to convince um, uh, the listeners here why it may be important to start using a cap, a distal cap, on the end of every upper endoscopy uh, procedure that uh, we do. So this was a prospective randomized blinded crossover study that uh, wanted to, where the investigators wanted to evaluate uh, visualizing the major papilla when a cap was used on the end of the upper endoscope. So they had uh, 101 patients and they were randomized to either get an upper endoscopy with a distal cap or a standard no cap endoscopy. And then the standard no cap endoscopy patients underwent a cap assisted uh, procedure at the same time. Um, so everybody um, that had the procedure done had images taken of the ampulla. Then the images were sent to uh, three experts who were blinded to um, uh, in multiple uh, centers. So the primary outcome for uh, this study was they wanted to see if they were going to get a better look at the ampulla if a distal cap was used on the scope. And the secondary outcomes were if, I, if they used a distal cap, would it take longer for the procedure to happen? And would you get any extra diagnostic yield? Are you going to see anything extra that you would not have seen um, if you hadn't put the cap on? So um, the, were they able to see more of the ampulla? Yes. So they were able to get a complete examination of the ampulla in 97% of the patients who had a cap versus 24% who did not have a cap. And they were able to locate the ampulla um, in 100% of the patients uh, with a cap and 68% without the cap. And these, uh, the first finding was statistically significant. So in terms of did it take longer using a cap, it did. Um, and did they find extra findings? They did. So um, 11 out of the 51 patients had extra lesions seen when they underwent a cap-assisted procedure, and there were also extra incidental findings that were seen as well. So I hope um, this helps make the argument that um, a distal cap should be used when um, an upper endoscopy procedure is done. I want to thank Raju for making this um, uh, short video showing how a cap should be attached uh, to a scope. So there's um, the cap. There's multiple different uh, uh, manufacturers who make it. There is a, a hole in the side wall of the cap. It's nice to lubricate it in water, make it easier and more pliable to attach. On the scope, he's pointing out the accessory channel and then the objective lenses on the other side. And the side hole of the cap needs to go um, next to, uh, right up against the objective lens and across from uh, the accessory port. And Raj, you can uh, comment more on that later uh, when we get to a break, if you likes. Okay. Okay, so we'll start. That was the duodenum. We'll start talking about uh, the jejunum next. So the jejunum has uh, a thicker wall and it has more of these uh, mucosal folds called uh, valvula conventes. Um, the jejunum is about two and a half meters or about eight feet long, and it's attached by mesentery to the posterior abdominal wall, which means it's kind of hanging a little bit loosely and it moves freely within the abdominal cavity, which can either make it more uh, easier or more difficult to examine with a scope. And uh, the transition to the ilium 
uh, is not uh, easily distinguished uh, during an endoscopy procedure. So speaking of ileum, we'll get to that. And um, the ileum is attached to the colon by the, at the ileocecal uh, junction, also known as the ileocecal valve. So since the small intestine is so long, the easiest way to get to the ileum will be through a colonoscopy. So when you get to the cecum, you'll see the ileocecal valve. It's uh, a fold that is a little more fatty or lipomatous than the other um, uh, folds, but it can be very subtle also. Um, and on the image on the right, you can see where once you're closer to the cecum or within the cecum, you'll be able to see the separation between the two lips of the valve. And that's where you would introduce the scope in order to get into the terminal ileum. Um, so why is there a valve here? So the valve is to prevent reflux of colonic contents and bacteria into the small bowel. And the competence of the valve or the efficiency of the valve actually depends on the angulation between the terminal ileum and the cecum. So there are actually ligaments, superior and inferior ileocecal ligaments that kind of hold that angle in place to make sure that the valve is always functional. Again, a note to the fellows, I would encourage all the fellows during every colonoscopy that you do to try to intubate the terminal ileum. It's a, I do that on every colonoscopy unless I'm um, not able to for some reason, for example, if there's tumor involving the terminal ileum or the valve, um, but I always try. Um, and so I would encourage the fellows to do that as well. You're going to see pathology there. I've diagnosed Crohn's disease or enteritis on patients who just presented for a screening colonoscopy. So very important to do that. It's a part of a complete colonoscopy exam. So once you're inside the terminal ileum, this is what it looks like. And the ileum is about 12 feet long. So lots of uh, good things happen in the ileum. So now we've talked about the endoscopic aspects of the anatomy of the small bowel. And let's uh, look at the histology, we'll take a much closer look. So here are the walls of the small intestine. So the mucosa is made up of an epithelial layer of cells, lamina propria, which is connective tissue, and the muscularis mucosa, which is uh, obviously muscle. And outside of that, you'll see submucosa, which is again connective tissue, uh, muscularis externa, also known as muscularis propria, and then the serosa layer. So one of the one of the um, interesting features and very unique features of the small bowel is the presence of villi. So these are finger-like projections that occur um, in the small bowel mucosa, and they're made up of the epithelium and the lamina propria layer. Um, so the villi are um, very important for absorption. Again, they're increasing the surface area for absorption within the small bowel. The epithelium of the small bowel, it, it consists of columnar type cells called enterocytes, and each enterocyte actually has numerous microvilli. So again, finger-like projections within, uh, from the surface of each cell that makes up a villi, villus, um, and that further increases absorptive capacity. So it's all about absorption in the small bowel. Um, we talked about how um, macroscopically you can see the valvula conoventes, that increases surface area. Then you have the villi on a microscopic level, and then an even more uh, microscopic level, you can see um, that there, each enterocyte has microvilli present. So you have your submucosa, uh, and that's where the lymphatics and the arteries and veins are located, and uh, also some uh, nerve plexus is present there. The muscularis externa is made up of uh, two layers of muscle. Um, there's an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer, and between these layers of muscle uh, are the uh, orbox plexus, which is uh, a nerve plexus that is important to, for GI motility and peristalsis. So when you're thinking about two layers of muscle, the longitudinal layer is like the sleeve of a shirt. So when you pull up your sleeve, your basic lets the movement um, that uh, longitudinal muscle contraction will produce. Um, so it's really more of a pleating type of movement. The circular muscle, when it contracts, it's like putting on a belt and tightening it up. So it's more of a cinching maneuver. So both of these uh, movements are necessary in order to uh, propagate um, contents of the small bowel uh, down uh, the GI tract. So again, thanks to uh, Dr. Wei for uh, helping us with these histology images. Um, disclaimer that I'm not a GI pathologist. I'm not even a regular pathologist, but I will try to uh, kind of talk us through some of these histologic findings that we have. 
So um, you can see there's these finger-like projections uh, within uh, the normal small intestine, and these are the villi. So you can think of them kind of as fingers on a glove. Um, the epithelial layer are this um, single layer of cells that are um, the enterocytes, and they're a columnar-type cell. Um, you also have some goblet cells here, so there's some mucus production there as well. So the villi are made up of this epithelial layer and then this lamina propria layer um, as well. So um, within the lamina propria layer, you're going to see that there's these um, circular uh, glands known as the tubular interintestinal glands or the crypts of Lieberkuhn. And there you have stem cells and goblet cells, and then importantly, um, the digestive enzymes that are important uh, for the function of the small bowel are produced here. And then you have your muscularis mucosa layer. And then below that, within the submucosa, are these Brunner's glands. And this is actually an identifying feature of uh, the duodenum. So these are pres present in the duodenum. OK, so I think we can pause here um, and see if there are any questions, Raju, or any comments uh, before we move on to the next segment. So let's. Uh... Um, it's be beautifully done. Uh, excellent. Oh, really nicely thanks, done. Roger. Uh, I think it's uh, one of the things that I've certainly learned is to uh, figure out the different walls of the duodenum, how you can make mistakes. And the second thing is uh, I have uh, been using a cap at the end of my ETD scope uh, only recently. Uh, in the last maybe a uh, year or two. Uh, I've used CAP at the end of the colonoscope for a very long time. I think uh, thanks to Roy, uh, who actually introduced me to the CAP fitted uh, colonoscope. Uh, it makes a big difference, uh, especially you could, uh, I want to tell a story because it's very important for us to learn from that story or my own mistake. Uh, I took care of a gentleman and uh, I scoped him uh, uh, twice. Uh, first time I scoped him, I didn't find any findings in the duodenum. At that time, I used a regular EGD scope without a cap. And he came for a, a surveillance exam. And then the second time, I got into the habit of using a cap. So I used a cap fitted endoscope. I went into the duodenum. Uh, second portion, third portion were normal. I looked at the ampulla, it looked normal. As I came back into the bulb, what happens is the cap at the end of the scope, as you come against the pyloric ring, it stretches the duodenum. And uh, you can actually have a much beautiful, uh, much more a wider look uh, of the entire duodenum. And I found a carcinoid tumor in the bulb of the duodenum. So it was a very important lesson for me, and I hope uh, others uh, appreciate this. And uh, recently we looked at, uh, I reviewed a publication submitted to Video GIE, where the authors have actually missed a lesion between the D1 and D2 junction. Uh, that's a very difficult area. You go in and you come back, you come back fast and you miss that between the D1 and D2, uh, they have actually were able to figure out that there was an adenoma and that was possible because of a cap and they were able to successfully resect it by using the cap fitted endoscope. So I want to make it a point to uh, get you all into the habit of using a cap routinely for all upper GI scopes. And it's also very useful for examining your esophagus uh, and also your stomach, uh, the area of interest where you can maintain that specific distance. Uh, maybe I could invite Roy or Ravi to make some comments. Roy? I think it's, it's uh, awesome that you guys are talking about the use of CAP to this degree. Uh, I think uh, it was not... Uh, obvious or imaginable that uh, we would uh, be saying that uh, it should be uh, routine. I, I, I 
thing though uh in many cases uh there are the advantages to look at the uh g e junction uh mm -hmm. is uh probably should be more emphasized no right 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 yeah. Yeah. you know for sure uh, in the treatment i of, agree uh, with the <laughs> For sure, in the treatment of duodenal ulcer bleed, the use of a cap is almost uh, almost uh, uh, should almost be routine. Otherwise, uh, it's so hard to to treat either the bulb bleed or uh, bleeding from the second portion or uh, first second portion. Uh, so uh, I think uh, for that, that should be almost like a, like you have a du bleed. Uh, let's uh, take the scope out. Let's put the the cap on. Ravi, you were going to say something. No, I totally agree with what you said. Um, especially after uh, um, what you have taught me, I think the cap plays a major role uh, uh, in therapeutics, especially like fixing the lesion, and then uh, in uh, helping with clipping. Sometimes you want to like adjust the depth of your clipping. Or you won't want to suck the lesion inside to like you know capture a lot of tissue. I think cap really helps that uh, helps well, and um, uh, for lesions in the posterior wall, uh, it makes a lot of difference to have a cap either with a long depth or a short depth. It helps to actually like uh, reach the lesion effectively. Um, I think um, um, cap is must when we do any therapeutics. Awesome. Uh, I think uh, what Rafi is saying uh, is that uh, there are two uh, uh, distances that we put the cap on. So meaning that the depth of the cap uh, is uh, adjusted according to what we need to do. So uh, when we uh, use uh, in the duodenum or for therapeutic in the esophagus, we use the cap at a long position. So that way uh, we can uh, uh, see the area that we want to treat better. And we also can put the accessories uh, within the cap and then we can see it. For example, if you're trying to clip, you don't want the cap to be in a short position. Uh, short here meaning two or three millimeter from the lens, uh, which is the um, focal distance for uh, zoom uh, endoscopy or magnification endoscopy, uh, we would want to uh, use a longer cap when we do treatment. And that is usually about four millimeter plus, if you can. Yeah, I agree. I think it's an excellent point to keep in mind. All right, Salve, let's go. Okay. So now we'll move on to um the physiology of uh, the small bowel. Uh, okay. So the, what does the small bowel do? So the small bowel is important for uh, digestion and absorption of nutrients, vitamins, and fluids. So the small bowel receives about 10 liters of water or fluid per day from the stomach, and it ends up absorbing 80% of that. So it absorbs eight liters of fluid a day um, and le lets about two liters of fluid go into the colon. The colon absorptive capacity is also um, very good. It can absorb 80 to 90% of, of the fluid that it receives, leaving about 100 to 200 mLs um, of uh, fluid to leave uh, with the stool. So we've talked about fluids. Let's talk a little bit about uh, nutrients next. So it's important uh, to know that the difference between digestion and absorption. So digestion is the, just the breakdown of uh, food and absorption is actually taking uh, the nutrients into um, the uh, small bowel mucosa. So if we think back, food is broken down in the, in the mouth uh, and that's mechanical. Uh, then the larger particles are broken down in the stomach and that's a combination of mechanical and chemical with the help of gastric acid and gastric pepsin. Um, then these much smaller par particles are sent into the small intestine. So, but the, the food or the nutrients are still in fairly large molecules. So those need to be broken down um, into basic 
building blocks that the small bowel is able to absorb. And this is done mainly through a chemical or enzymatic process. So we'll talk about um, the absorption of lipids or fats, carbohydrates, which are big sugars, and protein. So here we have uh, lipids. Uh, those are broken down uh, with the help of lipase, which is produced by the pancreas, and bile salts and acid, bile acid, which is produced by the liver and delivered into the ampulla through the bile duct. Um, so, once, so that allows lipids to get broken down into its building blocks, which are fatty acids and glycerol, and these can then be absorbed into the digenum. So next come carbohydrates. These are just very, very large sugars. And that's why whenever we cut down on the amount of carbohydrates that we eat, we generally tend to lose weight because they're basically just sugars um, once they get broken down. So the first step in carbohydrate metabolism um, to a minor degree is salivary amylase, but the majority of it is done through the help of pancreatic amylase. And that breaks carbohydrates, these big sugars into monosaccharides, which are single sugars, and dye or oligosaccharides, which are smaller sugars, but still not ready for um, absorption in the digenum. So the next step is the brush border carbohydrates, um, which are produced within the brush border or within the um, lumen of the uh, small bowel mucosa. And these enzymes include lactase, sucrase, maltase, and isomaltase. And that helps break these dye and oligosaccharides down into simple sugars or monosaccharides that are glucose, galactose, and fructose, and these can be absorbed um, into uh, the digenum. So next comes proteins, and this is a little bit more of a complicated process. So the building blocks of proteins are, of course, amino acids, and uh, the initial breakdown of proteins happens with the help of gastric pepsin. The next, and that breaks um, proteins down into amino acids and still polypeptides, not exactly all amino acids. So the next step is going to be um, pancreatic enzymes called trypsin and chymotrypsin. So these are actually um, secreted from the pancreas in an inactive state called the zymogen state, um, and they need to be activated in order to work in, to break down um, proteins. The um, activating enzyme is enterokinase, and this is produced by the small intestine. So the reason why pancreatic enzymes need to be secreted in an inactive state is that the uh, pancreas itself is a big protein. Um, and if these enzymes were activated within the pancreas um, itself, it would lead to autolysis or autodigestion of the pancreas. So they're secreted in a kind of a sleeping or inactive state. Once they're delivered into the small bowel, the small bowel makes the activating enzyme enterokinase. The pancreatic enzymes are activated and they're able to break these um, polypeptides down into further into amino acids and oligopeptides. So those simple amino acids can be absorbed by uh, the small intestine, but the oligopeptides need to undergo further um, digestion. And this actually happens with the help of Again, brush border uh, peptidases or enzymes that are um, located within the microvilli of the small bowel, and then they're broken down into amino acids, dye and tripeptides, and then are able to be absorbed uh, by the digenum. So again, this is a very highly simplified kind of graphic illustration of how these different nutrients are broken down. There's entire textbooks that are written by these about these um, processes, but I just wanted to, again, give you uh, all just a little flavor and pique your interest to read more on your own. So um, that's in general um, what, the, uh, what the digenum does, but let's talk a little bit about um, specifically what the duodenum does. So the functions of the duodenum are to receive these small particle food boluses from the stomach, and it provides uh, what people are calling now a safe space, right, for some of these enzymes and uh, pancreatic juices to start working to digest. So pancreatic juices work best in an alkaline environment, not in an acidic environment like the stomach. And so the duodenum provides this safe space, this alkaline environment by increasing the pH and allows all of these um, activities to occur. Um, the duodenum also initiates the process of digestion and absorption of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Um, and importantly, the specific function of the duodenum is absorption of vitamins and nutrients. So these are the two plus 
um, vitamins and nutrients, as I like to call them. And you can remember it because the duodenum is a duo, starts with duo, and you're looking at the two plus um, uh, minerals like calcium, magnesium, iron, phosphorus, copper, zinc, and some of the fat soluble vitamins are absorbed in the duodenum. So we'll move on now to uh, the jejunum and what it specifically does. We did talk about this in the previous slides. It does do the majority of digestion and absorption of uh, lipids, monosaccharides, and amino acids. Uh, it also absorbs calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, iron, zinc. The B vitamins except vitamin B12, vitamin C, and fat-soluble vitamins. So now we'll talk about uh, what the ileum does. And the functions of the ileum, again, include absorption of these nutrients. And the specialized function of the ileum is that it absorbs vitamin B12, and it absorbs bile salts and bile acids. It absorbs it, and, and, and these bile um, salts enter the enteropathic circulation and get returned back to the liver. So the reason why I'm kind of going over this in um, this much detail even is that we all see patients who have diseases of the small bowel where their absorption of certain nutrients, vitamins, minerals may be impaired, or uh, in our, our case at MD Anderson, patients who've had resection of different parts of their small intestine, um, and uh, then you need to be aware of uh, what each segment of the small intestine does so that you can be um, cognizant of certain nutrient deficiencies that a patient may have. So that's all I had in terms of physiology of the small bowel. Raju, I don't know if you want to stop here again or if you want me to continue through. Um... Let's uh, continue. I think that's okay. then we can have a discussion after that. Okay. That's okay. Nicely done. So, oh, thank you, Raju. So we're now going to talk about some kind of clinical cases that I've had uh, of patients with uh, small bowel disease. And I know there was a comment um, about taking biopsies in celiac disease. So uh, we have a, we'll have a case of that also, and we'll be able to address some of those comments um, later during the discussion. So um, case number one is a 67-year-old man who was found to have mantle cell lymphoma that was found incidentally during his screening colonoscopy that was done outside of MD Anderson. So he comes to the lymphoma doctors um, here for further evaluation and treatment. And the lymphoma team refers him for an upper endoscopy and another colonoscopy in order to evaluate for uh, what's called extra nodal disease. And the patients are able to enroll in certain clinical trials based on uh, the um, distribution of their um, lymphoma. So I did, this is his upper endoscopy procedure. Um, the first image shows a little uh, erosion in the uh, duodenal bulb. Um, second picture is just the second portion of the duodenum. Third picture is uh, uh, the ampulla. Obviously, I didn't use a cap, so there's not a great picture of the ampulla. Um, that was for educational purposes. Um, and then the pictures at the bottom here show these just mounded up uh, mucosal, uh, submucosal lesions and uh, biopsies of all of these areas were done and they all showed uh, mantle cell lymphoma, even the areas that looked normal, like the second picture um, that's on the screen. So we'll move on to the next case. And this is a, a two-part case. It's two different patients. It's a companion case, as one of my colleagues likes to say. Um, this is a 69-year-old man. He has a family history of polyposis. Um, and that was the reason why he started having screening colonoscopies done starting at age 16 to age 45, and no adenomas were found. So he takes a hiatus. He's not been tested for any genetic syndrome. Um, so he resumes his screening colonoscopies at age 57. At that time, he has more than 100 um, adenomas in his colon and a rectal mass, which of course comes back as adenocarcinoma. So the patient undergoes a total abdominal colectomy with an end ileostomy, and he presents now for upper GI tract uh, surveillance. And he, in the meantime, has had genetic testing done and is found to have a germline mutation in the APC gene, consistent with uh, FAP. And his clinical situation is actually more suggestive of an attenuated type picture. So in his uh, duodenum, we can see that this is, a, this is kind of a granular appearing lesion here. And then when I was pulling the scope back, uh, you can see again that there's these kind of very small granular lesions. Um, when I was pulling the scope back, I noticed there was some scope trauma. So looking carefully on this wall uh, of the duodenum, you can see that there's a, a, a lesion there as well that maybe extends down here. 
And looking at his um, ampulla with a distal cap attachment, I might add, you can see that the inferior aspect of the ampulla actually looks quite granular, and this is a closer view of that. So biopsies were taken of all of these lesions. Let me go through the companion case first, and then I'll show you the um, histopathology. So this is case 2B, I'm calling uh, it. It's, this is a 56-year-old woman who's morbidly obese. She's had a subtotal colectomy for prophylactic reasons at age 19 because, again, she had a family history of polyposis and colon cancer. At age, so it's a subtotal colectomy. They've left the, col the rectum in place. And she, of course, develops a rectal adenocarcinoma at age 50 and undergoes a proctectomy this time with an end ileostomy. Um, she has genetic testing done herself and is found to have a pathogenic mutation in the APC gene, of course. And she presents for upper uh, GI tract surveillance as well as um, yeah. This is a patient who's had bariatric sleeve gastrectomy done. And I think I used her um, gastric images um, on endoscopy when I did my um, gastric anatomy class to demonstrate what a sleeve gastrectomy looks like. So this is, she has much worse disease uh, in the duodenum. So she's got multiple large plaques, and this is at the apex of the bulb just before you make the turn into the duodenum. And there are just multiple tiny granular lesions. Here's a very large flat plaque um, in the duodenum. This picture shows that the entire you know, upper hemisphere of the duodenum is just covered with these flat plaque-like lesions. Um, the next picture um, shows um, this large plaque here um, all over the duodenum. Um, and here, looking at the ampulla, the ampulla looks like it's pretty much spared. But again, you see these lesions here and here that are present. And here, actually, here's another guy right here. Okay, so now I've done the annotation and now it's not going to, hopefully it will let me click down. Yep. Okay, should never start, try something new. It usually ends up not working out. Let's see if I can do this. Ah. Try and see if you could escape. Here, maybe do this. Sorry, Raju. No. Oh, no. well, this That's is the, <laughs> this is great. Okay. So anyway, please just. I hope these blue things will go away at some point. You have an um, eraser. You could use an eraser. Yes, to I do that. have an eraser. I do have an eraser here. Okay. So no more annotation will yeah. occur no, 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 for no, the rest no, of this no. presentation. That will be it. Okay, so we leave this alone now. We now don't play with this. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I learned that I probably shouldn't do annotation live during a presentation. <laughs> is what I learned. Anyway, okay, moving on. Um, sorry about that, everyone. So um, this is a picture of the um, ili uh, of her ileostomy. So it's important to take the external appliance off so that you're able to really look at the base of the. Uh, of the ileum at the ileoscopy. And then when I put the scope in, she had these tiny uh, little lesions. Here they are on NBI imaging. So all of these were biopsied. And this is basically um, what it showed. So this is, you can see that um, the normal villi architectural pattern is disrupted. You can also see that the um, epithelial layer is a lot darker blue uh, than it normally is. Um, and let me, I just included the normal um, small bowel mucosa so you can kind of compare that this is what normal is and then this is what uh, tubular adenoma looks like. So you can, the nuclei are not basally located. They're trying to climb up towards the luminal surface. That's called pseudostratification. And the nuclei are also not round, but more elongated or pencillate. Uh, and so this is the definition of low-grade dysplasia or um, a tubular adenoma. So all of the lesions that I showed you before uh, were tubular adenomas. 
so we'll move on to the third case. Um, this is a 66-year-old woman who was admitted to the hospital after surgery for serous carcinoma of the cervix that was um, thought to be invading into her rectum. She developed coffee grand emesis uh, without melana. She's anemic and tachycardic, and so an urgent upper endoscopy procedure is performed. And here you can see within the bulb, uh, there's some superficial ulceration and more superficial ulceration within the second portion of the duodenum. And here at the apex of the bulb with the duodenal sweep is a two and a half centimeter ulcer with flat uh, pigmented material. So this is what duodenal ulceration looks like. We'll move on uh, to the next case. So this is a 63-year-old man who underwent upper endoscopy outside of MD Anderson for melana back in 2015. And at that time, he was found to have a nine millimeter by four millimeter duodenal bulb nodule. So biopsies outside showed duodenal carcinoma. Um, on endoscopic ultrasound, this was thought to involve the MP or muscularis propria layer uh, and not thought to be um, possible for endoscopic resection. In addition, he's a poor surgical candidate because of his multiple medical comorbidities and he presents for routine uh, surveillance exams. So um, in the bulb, here is uh, this lesion involving the submucosa with a little bit of a central depression. And here are um, pictures where uh, biopsy is being taken. This is a different uh, example of uh, uh, the same type of lesion. So this lesion was more amenable to endoscopic resection. So the endoscopist is um, injecting uh, saline for a mucosal lift of this six millimeter by three millimeter nodule in the bulb. Um, it was removed with hot snare, and then the site was um, ablated with APC or argon plasma coagulation. On endoscopic ultrasound, the lesion was isoechoic involving the mucosa and submucosa. So I thought I would include um, this picture again, just to kind of give us a baseline reference. So when we do biopsies with forceps, we're doing mucosal biopsies. So we're only getting the mucosal layer. So if you have a lesion such as a carcinoid that's going to involve the submucosa, it's important to do what are called bite on bite biopsies. You take a mucosal biopsy bite and then in that same location, you take another bite and hopefully you'll be able to sample more of the submucosal layer and the lesions that are located there. So this is a histology of a carcinoid. We can see that it's involving the, so this is where the villi should be. Um, and here you see that the mucosa and submucosa are all kind of infiltrated by these small round cells um, that are described as a salt and pepper appearance. And this is a special stain. So if you wanna see what kind of, or confirm that this is indeed a carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumor, you can do um, a chromogranin stain. So the chromogranin is present in the secretory granules of these neuroendocrine cells. Um, and the staining of, with chromogranin depends on the presence of these granules. And depending on the location within um, the small intestine or within the GI tract, whether it's a foregut or hindgut neuroendocrine tumor, um, the staining and how uh, well or poorly differentiated it is, you'll have variable staining with the chromogranin. Um, so this is another stain that can be done to confirm that this is a carcinoid tumor. This is a synaptophysin stain, and it's present in the neuroendocrine cells and in uh, neurons as well. So um, this is a KI67 stain. So the World Health Organization kind of reclassified neuroendocrine tumors in 2017, and the grade of the tumor depends on both the mitotic index and the KI67 index, which is, again, just an idea of how quickly um, the cells within the carcinoid are replicating. So we'll go to our uh, last case. Um, this is a 60-year-old woman with a history of third portion um, duodenal adenocarcinoma, and this was resected outside of MD Anderson in 2004. She was found to have lymph node positive disease and received chemotherapy for this. She had a follow-up upper endoscopy at MD Anderson in 2006, and digital biopsies showed villus atrophy that was suggestive of celiac disease. So she uh, was referred to me on a gluten-free diet, she says, uh, for an EGD to evaluate some new symptoms of nausea and abdominal fullness. So um, bio the endoscopic pictures were unremarkable, but we did, I did biopsies, of course, and this is kind of just a composite view of what biopsies 
uh, from the small bowel looked like. You can see that already you don't see that normal fingers in a glove pattern of uh, projecting villi. So on a uh, closer look on a different section of the uh, small bowel, um, you can see that the villi are there. They're long and finger-like. The tips are rounded. Um, but the problem here is the fact that there are lymphocytes that are present within uh, the epithelial layer. And an increased number of lymphocytes is basically the first step uh, in having problems that are suggestive of uh, celiac disease. So this is another segment uh, where you see that the villi are not fingers in a glove, but they're more like knuckles. They've kind of, they're shortened and they're uh, lost their normal architectural appearance. And then here you have atrophy. You don't even have, I mean, maybe a little bit of a knuckle over here, but here there's no villi, nothing at all, nothing projecting into the lumen. Um, so this is villus atrophy. So um, there's a MARSH classification for um, a celiac disease. Uh, MARSH-1 is increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, but the crypts and the villi will be normal. Uh, MARSH-2 is having uh, the increased number of lymphocytes and an increased number of crypts, but normal villi. Uh, once you start having the villi that are not rounded at the tip, but more flat tipped, that's a 3A. Once the villi are shortened and you see knuckles, that's a 3B marsh classification. And once you have villus atrophy, increased crypts, and increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, that's a 3C classification of marsh. So that's basically all I had. In summary, we talked about the anatomic features of the small bowel with an emphasis on the endoscopic features. Um, we talked about what the small bowel does in terms of digestion and absorption of fluid, nutrients, vitamins, um, et cetera. And we hopefully talked about what I thought at least were interesting cases that um, affected the small bowel. Um, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Salvi. Uh, beautifully done. Uh, we'll open this uh, session for any questions. I think uh, one of the questions that came out was the uh, biopsies in terms of uh, how do you biopsy celiac disease? And that was uh, Joseph, uh, uh, my colleague, Joseph Zhang. Uh, and it's an important question. And I think for the sake of nurses and technicians, it's a good idea to remind uh, or gently nudge your physician uh, how about taking biopsies from the duodenal bulb as well? Uh, we, we typically take biopsies from the descending uh, duodenum or the third portion of the duodenum. Uh, the guidelines suggest that you need to take about four biopsies uh, from the distal duodenum and uh, two biopsies from the bulb. And uh, in the bulb, uh, they even describe where to take those biopsies, uh, typically between uh, 9 o'clock to, between 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock at the, at the roof of the bulb. And that's where you would get the maximum yield. Uh, the next question is, uh, how do you take a biopsy? You know, uh, we tend to take four biopsies and we are in a rush, so we want to uh, put the biopsy forceps out, take a biopsy, and then take another biopsy, uh, and then pull the uh, forceps out, and then the second run, again, two more biopsies. Uh, if you really want to have a good biopsy, it is best to take one biopsy at a time, and you will get more tissue if you use a biopsy forceps with a spike. Uh, something to keep that thing in mind. And so uh, four biopsies from the distal duodenum, and uh, don't forget to take a couple of biopsies from the duodenal bulb. Did, did you, David Graham, did you say you get more if you use it with a what? With a spike? What kind of biopsy? No, we've, we've studied that, and the spike just tears up the biopsy, so you, you get more if you actually suck a little bit and then take the biopsy with jumbo forceps and don't use a spike. Well, in fact, we, we don't use spikes because when we did the prospective experiment and say they screwed up the 
histopathology more than the ones without. I really appreciate that comment, Dr. Ram. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, in your study, you used a, a jumbo biopsy forceps routinely, and uh, without the yes. spike, and take only one biopsy per uh, uh, each run of the biopsy forceps. Yes. I mean, the key, I think, for speed is to have you pull, first of all, not to use a colonoscopic uh, forceps for upper endoscopy because you have to stay in the next room to pull it out. Uh, so that with the regular forceps, you can pull it out and the technician has the bottle there. When, as soon as you pull it out, you can wash the biopsy off into the bottle and put it back again. And so I would do 29 targeted biopsies in the stomach in seven minutes with jumbo forceps, routinely. Okay, okay. I wish- uh, That's not the world record, but that's my average. <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, you know, and uh, these, these things are important. I wish uh, we could ask one of your fellow uh, to videotape uh, your technique and, uh, and share it. Uh, because uh, it will be helpful for people. You know, we all read about things, but we don't necessarily learn uh, the correct way because there's a, a little bit of a uh, difference in understanding about what is uh, read in a written word and what is what they see in a video. I wish uh, uh, one of your fellow could actually videotape uh, the technique and then... Uh, well, our unit the now, because, because of cost, uses only colonoscopic biopsy forceps. And it, so now the, the, you have to have someone else pull it out. It's very inefficient, but they, they're, you know, most of the units are not for quality, they're for speed and efficiency. Yeah. But I don't even think that gets either one. So you suggest that you take the biopsy forceps. Right. Right, okay. That's a very good idea, thank you so much. One of the comments uh, that Joseph made is that um, it really depends on how quickly or slowly the technician opens and closes the biopsy forceps. Um, if they close it more slowly, you're always going to grasp more tissue each pass, each bite. Um, and so I, I, I agree with him completely. And if I see a tech um, closing very quickly, I'll tell them, please close slowly. Um, and the other thing is that they should really only, uh, I think I personally uh, like it more when uh, the technician opens and closes the forceps when I say, rather than kind of when they want to do it themselves. I think that last part's the key, not the slow. Yeah. Because yeah. if you put just a little suction, and then yeah. that brings the, the biopsy into, you know, kind of around the forceps, and, and then say, now they, they do it at the right time. Right. But, you know, if, communication if, people, if they're trained, they're, they know exactly where you're going to go and what they're going to do and what bottle it goes in, et cetera. Right. Well, that's what hopefully this um, Sunday morning Zoom endoscopy rounds is going to help a lot of um, technicians uh, learn some of the, you know, better techniques that we prefer as physicians. And then a technician can say, Dr. Rajiv, that's not the way Dr. Thea Murphy does it. <laughs> right, exactly. Which I think, <laughs> they, I'm sure they say that all the time already, but yes. I'm <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Graham. I, I tell them, sir, that I didn't have the opportunity to train with you, so it's okay. I'm, I'm learning now. Well, that's why we're here, because we're all, we're all, all learning. I'm really yes. grateful to you for joining uh, and helping us. It means a lot yeah, to us. We're all yeah, thank you, Dr. Ram. And we're all learning, and that's a good segue just for another reminder of the Zoom rounds that are happening next Sunday. It's Learning for Life um, with Dr. Graham giving us uh, tips and techniques, hopefully, um, for how he has been learning throughout his long and illustrious career, and hopefully we'll be able to pick up some hints. And no matter where we are, whether we're fellows in training now or whether we're junior faculty or old-time faculty like myself, um, we can still pick up some tips and, and carry them forward.
um, some good ideas for learning. So please join us next uh, Sunday. I'll be moderating and we'll have some fellows um, who have some questions. Uh, we'll have a discussion panel with them. And of course, everybody who's participating can ask questions as well. All right. Dr. Graham, you have to be here. He's already left. <laughs> can I share you? Uh, yeah. So in case 2B, that case 2B actually you had shown us uh, very rare findings of uh, duodenal neoplasms, uh, which is a, a depressed duodenal uh, cancer. In that the, 50 those, case. The one that was bleeding slightly. In the FAP case, right? Yeah, it's 2B, yeah. I think. Yeah, let me, I can, let me see if I can share my uh, screen again. So when I start doing something that doesn't, I haven't done before, that's usually when the problems happen, but we will try here. This one. Yes. yes. The one on the right. Yes. Yes. That's very beautiful. So I biopsied, yes. So I biopsied that and it actually, this is 2A, uh, but anyway, I biopsied this and it was, um, it just came back as uh, tubular adenoma. It did not come back mm. as cancer. Maybe. Maybe, it may be sampling error. Uh, so with these patients with FAP, we generally keep a pretty close eye on them and we do biopsies, uh, upper endoscopy every year. Uh, maybe I'll bring them back in six months instead and take no, it's, more biopsies. It's, it's, it's possible that it's just a, an adenoma, sure. Okay. But it's, a, it's nevertheless, it's a depressed lesion. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. And I just want to thank everybody and the survey for a beautiful uh, lecture covering the, the Warnum. I really appreciate that. And uh, hope you all have uh, a good weekend and we'll see you next week. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. See you guys. Thank you, Ravi.